Hi, good morning. My name is Dr. Jessica Bernacki, and I'm here to talk about the role of behavioral health in gender affirming care. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist here at UCLA and the behavioral health director of the UCLA Gender Health Program. My name is Dr. Brandon Ito. I'm an assistant clinical professor of psychiatry at the David Geffen School of Medicine and also a provider within the Gender Health Program. Um, just a reminder, um, feel free to ask questions on Twitter using the hashtag UCLAMDChat or comment on Facebook. We'd love to hear from you. So we would like to thank you all for joining us on National Coming Out Day and give you a little bit of a path through our talk today. So our first goal is to introduce you to the behavioral health team of the UCLA Gender Health Program. Next, we will take a broad overview of gender identity development going from childhood to adulthood. We'll next present some common behavioral health challenges um, that individuals may come up with as they are going through their transition or going through treatment, and then discuss the role of behavioral health in your gender affirming care. All right, so first just to introduce our program. Um, here at UCLA, our gender health program is a, t is a a uh, large interdisciplinary team of specialists made up of uh, primary care providers, endocrinologists, gynecologists, plastic surgeons, urologists, fertility specialists, our behavioral health team, and care coordination. Um, I wanted to make sure we included our contact information in case you have any more information about our program um, or any, any ways in which we can uh, help you uh, moving forward. Okay, so I always like to make sure that I start off with some background information about the terminology that we use. So we're all starting off on the same page. Um, when we talk about gender identity, we're really talking about an individual's internal sense of themselves. Um, this is, you know, often somebody identifying as either masculine, feminine, um, some combination of the two or neither. Um, but it's really someone's internal sense of themselves. Um, and gender expression is how a person outwardly displays their gender identity. Um, this can be um, a way in which someone uh, dresses, some, a way in which someone may style or cut their hair. Um, it may also be the activities someone chooses to engage in um, or the individuals or peers they choose to kind of associate with um, or in youth, the, the, you know, other kids they choose to play with. Um, this is, you know, uh, important to distinguish from sex, um, which is a label that is assigned at birth based on an infant's genitalia. Um, another uh, term to use for this might be natal sex. Um, and again, most individuals at birth are labeled either male, female, or um, intersex. A transgender person is uh, typically someone whose identity, gender identity differs from their sex assigned at birth. Um, and this is usually um, compared to a, or contrasted with a cisgender person who is a person whose gender identity matches their sex assigned at birth. Um, transition is the process by which an individual expresses a new gender identity. Um, and a large part of our role as a behavioral health team is to help support people through the transition process. Um, gender affirmation is really a way in which we um, and, and others interact with people in a way to support their gender identity and is really the model with which our team um, broadly um, interacts with or cares with our patients. Um, additional terms you may um, come across um, if learning more about this uh, topic um, are things like gender non-binary, gender fluid, gender non-conforming, or gender diverse. Um, these are other identity terms um, that generally, again, reflect individuals whose um, you know behaviors or identities may not conform to societal expectations based on someone's um, natal sex or um, assigned gender. Um, so we know that language is a uh, rapidly evolving thing. Um, so you may come across these terms or completely different terms. Um, we always start off by asking people how they identify um, and sometimes ask them to help, you know, explain what that means to them and then use the terms that people um, talk with us about to make sure we're as up to date as possible. Um, this is a, just a graphic that can help highlight the differences between the concepts that I already introduced. Um, so there's someone's sex assigned at birth. Um, again, is that classification typically based on genitalia? 
um, the gender identity, gender expression, and then this graphic adds in another term of uh, what we typically talk about as sexual orientation. Um, so a person's romantic or sexual attraction to other to others, um, and typically that's based on someone else's um, sex or gender. Um, and here we can talk about someone being attracted to a person of the same gender as themselves, a different gender, or multiple genders. Um, so again, a nice visual to maybe um, to show kind of the differences between the terms I, I already went through. So I think it's also helpful to have a framework of when gender identity develops and how it develops. Um, and it really, we know that this starts at a very early age. Um, so kids as young as two are, are aware of the physical differences um, between natal males and females. Again, typically um, distinguishing individuals based on genitalia. Um, and they can start to talk about these physical differences. Um, by age three, youth are able to label themselves typically as a boy or a girl. Um, so it's, a, it's by around age three that youth might actually start to talk about noticing a difference between how they identify and how they're labeled. Um, so you may start to hear about those differences um, as early as age three. Um, around age four, youth start to have a pretty stable sense of their gender identity, not only what it is, but that it is um, something that's stable and will not change or, or you know, um, is less likely to change. Um, you know, we know that um, youth who um, start to talk about this difference in their identity, um, a difference in their identity from their kind of sex assigned at birth, um, that youth who are really persistent, consistent, and insistent about their gender identity um, are most likely to identify as transgender or gender diverse in adulthood. Um, although you know youth may start to talk about this at a very early age, it's not the only age in which um, the question of um, having this incongruence between your assigned gender and your experienced gender may occur. We also know that adolescence, um, which is a time in which, again, people go through puberty and have the changes in their um, body physically as a result of puberty, um, that this is another time when youth may start to um, identify or question their gender identity as being different than their assigned uh, gender or sex assigned at birth. So when we talk um, a little bit more about gender variance in childhood, um, there's kind of two different phenomena that are important to be aware of um, and just make notes. So gender non-conforming behaviors, again, is really a behavioral phenomenon and is very common in childhood. Um, this is, um, you know, really any child who's engaging in behaviors that um, are um, kind of contrary to what society would expect based on their assigned gender. Um, you know, youth who maybe later identify as transgender or who have gender dysphoria can certainly show gender non-conforming behaviors, but it doesn't mean that all youth who show gender non-conforming behaviors um, have gender dysphoria or may would later identify as transgender. Um, gender dysphoria really is about an ident the identity piece and really identifying um, as a gender that is different than their assigned gender. Um, and again, as I mentioned, um, you know, when we look at the ages of youth who present to gender specialty clinics, there tends to be two age clusters that are seen. Um, early childhood, again, those young kids from a very early age start to talk about their gender being different than their labeled gender. Um, but also adolescence, again, during that time of puberty when their body starts to change, realizing that there's that incongruence. So gender dysphoria um, is really important for us to talk about because I feel like the dysphoria is actually where I think our behavioral health team comes into play to help support patients. Um, so gender dysphoria is the distress that can accompany the incongruence between one's experienced or expressed gender and one's assigned gender, or again, that natal sex or sex assigned at birth. Um, in youth, um, this can include behaviors like talking about the desire or insistence that they are another gender, uh, preferring to wear the clothes of another gender or resisting wearing the clothing um, of their assigned gender, um, having different gender roles in imaginary play, 
um, than their kind of uh, labeled gender. Um, preference for toys or activities of another gender. Rejection of toys or activities of their assigned gender. Um, and it's actually, it's important to highlight now that, again, these are all based on kind of societal expectations of what we would assume a kind of boy or girl should play with, what they should wear and what they should do. Um, so keeping that kind of context or assumption in mind. Um, preference for claimants of another gender, um, disliking their sexual anatomy, or desiring the primary or secondary physical characteristics that match someone's experienced gender. Um, in adolescents and adults, um, again, there's still this distress um, related to one's experience or expressed gender and their assigned gender. Um, again, it tends to focus um, a lot more on, um, again, identity and physical characteristics. So noting a difference between ex expressed gender and primary sex uh, and secondary sex characteristics. Um, desiring to be rid of one's primary or secondary sex, sex characteristics because of an incongruence uh, with their experienced gender. Desiring, again, the primary or secondary sex characteristics of another gender. Desiring to be another gender or insistence that they are. Um, and again, a strong conviction that one has the typical feelings and reactions of another gender. Um, gender affirmation, um, you know, as I mentioned, this is really about affirming, um, or sorry, of helping um, support a patient with recognizing, accepting, and expressing their gender identity. And the gender affirmation process um, is a very individualized process. Um, each person, um, for, you know, can decide to affirm their gender identity in a variety of ways. Um, and again, our role is really to help people to affirm that in a way that feels right to them. Um, people may choose to um, pursue kind of a social affirmation process, so t choosing a name and pronouns that reflects their um, gender identity, choosing a manner of dress that is consistent with their gender identity. Um, some individuals choose medical affirming procedures. This can be um, use of hormones um, or surgical interventions that help align their um, bodies to be more consistent with their gender identity. Um, and legal affirmation, some individuals choose to change na name and gender marker um, on identity documents to again um, help them affirm their gender identity. So our role as behavioral health providers here in the UCLA uh, Gender Health Program um, are again to help support patients in a variety of ways with this process of transitioning um, and seeking affirming care. Um, we are currently um, part of the primary care team, um, meaning when patients come to the uh, UCLA Gender Health Program and come for an initial visit, we are there to help um, meet patients, introduce ourselves, um, and see how we can be of assistance. Um, we help um, together with the primary care providers that see our new patients, um, help clarify patients' goals for their visit, uh, discuss gender discuss a person's gender development and how to affirm their gender identity. So really hearing from a patient, um, what's causing you distress and how can we help address that? Um, assessing any additional, you know, related or unrelated behavioral health needs, just seeing how a patient maybe is coping emotionally and how we can help them if there's any um, sources of distress. Um, help fa families better understand and support one another. Um, you know, sometimes patients come with family members, friends, or loved ones, and um, we want to help support the whole, um, the whole family or whole group. Um, and then provide help with referrals and documentation um, for patients to pursue some gender affirming procedures. Some documentation um, is required often by insurance just to help cover procedures and um, one of the requirements is often behavioral health documentation of readiness um, and that's certainly something that our program um, assists patients with on a very regular basis. So next we're gonna discuss a few of the common behavioral health needs that we see individuals or patients come in presenting with. Later on, we'll talk about a few options for treatments um, if a individual decides or needs a certain type of care. So the first is an exploration of gender identity. Um, as we've discussed, this can develop throughout childhood and into adolescence and adulthood, and the transition is unique for every person. For some individuals, the coming out process or the early beginnings of the social transition can bring up a lot of different stresses or challenges 
um, which individuals can seek out uh, behavioral health treatment. There are also other behavioral health concerns, such as depression or anxiety, which may or may not have anything to do with their current transition or their gender identity. Again, we, the behavioral health team can also provide help with connections with medical providers to either provide gender affirming care, but also to facilitate discussions and make sure that people are feeling understood and meeting their goals and treatment. Um, we'll also talk a lot a little bit later about different types of treatments, the therapies and or medications, if those um, would be useful to meet people's goals. We wanted to spend a minute to talk a little bit about minority stress theory. So we at the UCLA Gender Health Program um, want to stress that the mental and physical health problems that we commonly see in LGB and transgender individuals is not due to an underlying issue with identity. Um, individuals who identify as either transgender or gender diverse often fa face very, very high rates of discrimination, stigma, harassment, and even violence and victimization. Over time, due to these chronic stressors, it can cause heightened physiological stress responses, which include mood dysregulation, difficulty with interpersonal relationships, and that combined with a limited set of coping or restricted sets of coping skills can increase vulnerability to illnesses, including behavioral health problems. Minority stress has been linked to lower scales of happiness and life satisfaction, decreased self-esteem, again, depression, anxiety, and even early use of substances such as cigarettes and alcohol. We want to also stress that this may also may be especially true for individuals who also identify with either a sexual minority group or a racial minority group in addition to a gender, uh, a gender minority group. So because of these chronic stressors that individuals may face, um, those who identify as transgender or gender diverse often face much higher rates of behavioral or mental health conditions. These can include post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, major depression, again, anxiety, and this can be a generalized anxiety, meaning worries about the future, worries about many different types of things, or social anxieties, um, which really impair or get in the way of people socializing and being able to live their lives. Again, it can result in a higher rate of substance use disorders and also suicidal thoughts and attempts. When we specifically look at transgender youth, um, studies have shown that transgender youth are higher for all risk factors, um, which may contribute to the development of future behavioral health problems. These include suicidality, substance use, risky sexual behaviors, emotional distress, and again, the bullying and victimization. Youth are also lower on a number of protective factors that we know decrease the risk of future uh, mental health problems, including internal assets or um, ability to cope through stressful situations because of the unique challenges that they face. Um, it can disrupt family connectedness, uh, student-teacher relationships, and overall feelings of being safe in their communities. Um, one important topic that we definitely need to discuss is the issue of suicide. Um, so individual, when we look at transgender or gender diverse youth, approximately 50% of youth experience suicidal thoughts in their early years of life. Um, one in four report making a prior suicide attempt. And when we look at adults, um, these statistics translate uh, further into adulthood with approximately 40 to 50 percent of transgender adults reporting a prior suicide attempt in their life. Um, when we compare this to the general U.S. population statistic of less than 5 percent, we can see that this is definitely an increased and serious issue um, that we want to make sure to address. Um, when when we look at research studies, we know that suicidal thoughts are often related to individual sense of being a burden or feelings of lower belonging. And this can be either within their 
immediate families or within the larger community or schools, which is why this brings us to the next important topic of support. Um, when, when individuals are supported in their gender expression, their gender development, their gender identity, we see that there's improved functioning and less symptoms. And this is particularly important for youth um, with their parental or caregiver support. This graphic is just to show that in LGB and transgender youth, when youth come from highly rejecting families or, or families where they feel like acceptance and validation is low, they are greater than eight times, um, they have a greater than eight times risk of a lifetime suicide attempt compared to families um, which have low rejecting qualities. And again, when we look at family, youth who come from very extremely accepting families or very accepting families, these youth can develop with 92% reporting that they can believe to grow and develop into a happy LGB and, and or transgender adult. So other studies have shown that when transgender youth are able to have gender affirming treatment, um, so pubertal suppression followed by gender affirming hormones and sometimes gender affirming surgery, that this both improves their gender dysphoria and their psychological functioning. In fact, when these adults, when these individuals are followed into adulthood, we see levels of well being, reported well being, and psychological symptoms that are similar or better than their cisgender peers. To talk a little bit about different types of treatment, um, our program hopes to provide overall general wellness support. So whether that be support with sleep, whether that be support with exercise or diet, um, along with other treatments for some of the conditions we talked about earlier, such as individual therapy. And there are many types of individual therapy ranging from cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT um, to dialectical behavioral therapy or DBT. Um, which can be helpful for a lot of individuals. Um, especially for individuals who don't have robust supports or maybe lack a community, group therapies and support communities, being in a group or the support of their peers can also be very validating um, and supportive in their treatment. And like Dr. Bernacki mentioned earlier, um, sometimes due to a number of the stressors, this can cause either communication difficulties or conflicts within the family, and different types of family therapy or support can also be useful. For individuals who have conditions which are really impairing or which are causing a lot of distress, medications combined with therapies can be another helpful solution um, for a select number of individuals. Additionally, because youth depend and spend so much time in different community settings, such as school, um, one way that the behavioral health team can help to facilitate care is to introduce concepts to help youth move through school and have the schools be more, most supportive um, of their treatment and of their identity. All right. Um, so, as we kind of mentioned already, but we really, really don't make sure, want to make sure we highlight, um, every person's transition process is unique. Um, there's really no one path that anyone has to follow, and we really work um, here at the UCLA Gender Health Program to help m meet each person's individual needs and really talk through what is most distressing for them, if anything, and how to help address that. Um, again, whether this is um, helping them transition socially, medically, surgically, um, or legally. Um, just want to end today with a couple of uh, resources. Um, the WU Path um, is an international organization, um, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, um, that publishes guidelines that most um, healthcare providers use um, for transgender care and is a great resource for both providers and, and patients to be familiar with. Um, and there's a uh, their free standard, their guidelines or standards of care is uh, free publications available online. 
Um, the National LGBT Health Education Center is a great educational resource um, for those of you seeking more information. A local resource here in LA is the LA LGBT Center. And then as Dr. Ito mentioned, um, unfortunately, suicidality is, um, you know, something that is a common experience for individuals who identify as trans or gender diverse, given, you know, this is a quite a vulnerable population. Um, and it's helpful to have some resources focused on um, support around that. Um, so the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and the Trevor Project are two excellent resources that are available 24 hours a day and have both phone numbers and chat options for, for support. Um, all right, we just want to thank you um, so much for being here today and now take some people's questions. All right, um, so we have some great questions to, to start with. Um, the first question is, um, do I have to be in therapy in order to start hormones? Okay. Should I kick that one off? Sure. Okay. Um, so here at our UCLA Gender Health Program, um, we work from kind of an informed consent model. Um, so we, we don't require a course of therapy prior to initiation of hormones. Um, we do meet with patients, talk about their goals for hormone therapy, um, and really discuss their uh, readiness um, to, to undergo that treatment. Um, and it's something that we work closely with patients in the primary care or endocrinologists to create a treatment plan that works for, for them. Um, our second question is, uh, my young son prefers to play with uh, more feminine or kind of girly toys. Um, does this mean he is transgender? Okay. So briefly, uh, my response to that would be not necessarily. Um, as we discussed in the developmental portion, it is perfectly normal for children, whether they identify as girls or boys, to explore different types of activities different toys, different types of dress. Um, and that does not necessarily mean that somebody will identify later as um, transgender or gender diverse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, when, when youth come to us, I think we, um, again, gather information about, um, you know, maybe what our parents' questions are, um, get to know the child and really help support them, typically following them over time to see how things take shape, um, but really work from an uh, affirmative model to, to help support that kid be as comfortable in their own skin as possible, um, regardless of how they identify. Sometimes I think it's useful to discuss with parents um, how to have conversations around those topics with children. Mm -hmm. um, generally, my stance is to take one of curiosity, so if children are expressing or showing um, either signs of distress or just gender diversity, just asking what interests them about certain activities. Why do they like certain toys? Why do they like certain games? Um, to just get a better understanding of what makes them happy. Uh, what parents often find out is that it actually has nothing to do with their gender identity. They just prefer certain toys and activities because they like them. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we always kind of stress that um, a supportive family environment is what's best for kids' outcomes overall. Um, so really helping support a kid in being their happy, you know, healthy self is what's most important. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think um, our last question is, um, when do I know if I need medication versus therapy? Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll let you handle that from the psychology end. Um, I think from a provider or psychiatric end, um, it's really, again, a discussion about levels of distress and how much symptoms are really getting in the way of people living their, their lives. Um, things that I take into consideration generally when recommending different types of treatments are the frequency of symptoms, the duration, um, and how intense they really are. So if, if somebody is in so much distress or feeling so low that they are unable to hang out with friends, if they're not, no longer enjoying um, work or school or things that they really used to love, um, those are, are some of the symptoms which make me more concerned and, and more likely to recommend that Medications may be useful to get the process going a little faster. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I think the only thing that I add to that, you know, you know, as a psychologist, uh, when doing therapy with someone, you know, if we're trying, if a patient's working really hard in their work with me, um, and yet really struggling to make progress because the levels of symptoms are so high that they just can't fully engage in the therapy process, then I usually say that maybe uh, medication in addition to therapy may be beneficial. And then we talk about um, how to start that process. Great. Well, we really want to thank you so much for being here today with us. We we are open for any questions, and we hope that you have information about our program. Um, and just like to stress, we're here for you. Thank you.